All right, so if you got your outlines there, the title is um, really not after the show because <clears throat> I was listening to a message that we had did clear back in early 2000s when we were teaching on something along these lines. And um, we were referring to us being dead and that it's something that we have to walk out. And I said, like, you know, being like the walking dead. And that was clear before the series. Um, so in actuality, it makes a lot of sense. But on the other hand, we have, besides being the walking dead, and that is we have to walk out our death, we are also walking the walking life. So it's simultaneously. We are dying to that which is not of God and alive to that which is God. So there's a constant, you, you just don't get this and just, okay, I don't need to no move, move on. The cross will always be the central thing in your life. What you're dead to and what you're alive to. And that goes on every <coughs> single day till you die. If not, then your Christian walk will be um, chaotic frustrating and you'll be failing more than you'll be succeeding because you will be uh, you'll be alive to the things you're supposed to be dead to and those things you're supposed to be dead to are going to th be the things that bring you down does that make sense yeah. all right so tonight's mm -hmm. message still looking at our death and i know this is like i don't know fourth message on specifying the death but it's very important because you won't be able to walk out all that he has if we're still tied to what he ended. It just won't make sense. Life will not make sense until you can clarify what is dead and what is alive. And so I'm going to take my time and stick to my notes because if I don't, I'm going to sidebar and be all over the place and we won't get through and I don't want to part two this today's message. Also on your outline, this outline goes with the one that we've been, it's been lingering around for several weeks. Because we, it's still, that's still that one outline, New Living Way. Mm -hmm. So this is part of that outline, just so you know that. Because on that outline, we're, we're, we talk about an internal war and an exterior war. So that's what we're going to really specify and delve into tonight and hopefully get off that outline and go and move on into the series. But I thought it was important that we stop and deal with death because you have to. And it has to constantly be your mindset. Now let me just say this. We're not saying you have to crucify yourself <clears throat> every day. Because that's already been done. You have to know that you are. Not that you do it. You have to know that you are and walk from done, walk out of what he did into the new that he's bringing you into. All right, so we're on a journey of experiencing truth. Freedom, when applied, brings application, or when freedom's applied, <coughs> application brings manifestation. Let me say that again. Experiencing truth results in freedom, and when that freedom is, is applied to our lives, it will bring forth manifestation. And God is designed for you to experience the manifestations of what He did on the cross. Today you will experience the power of God in your spirit from warfare you didn't even know you have going on inside of you and outside of you. And maybe to some degree you do. So there's an internal and external war and everyone has it. So first thing we're going to look at, you can see on your outline there, the eternal, internal war is where the application of the cross ending the deceitfulness of sin in us, against us, and liberating others. Understand, this is all for not just you, but Matthew 28. Be witnesses. Go into all the world and speak what he did. And when we're done, if I don't remember, if, if you want to write it down, say, hey, remind Greg, because I might forget to reiterate, but I'm going to say it on this end in case I forget to say it on the other end. And that is, what you're going to hear tonight is how you witness. Take everything you've seen on TV and everything you've learned how to witness and throw it out because this is how you witness. There's only one way to witness. It's to witness what Jesus did on the cross and what he did for them in their death and what he did through them in resurrection. 
So this, and you'll see, because hopefully we'll get to the end of this, and you'll see how we'll bring this all together. But let me say it again. The internal war is where the application of the cross, ending the deceitfulness of sin in us, against us, and liberating others. Now I want you to see something. Deceitfulness of sin may not be completely what you have always thought it to be. And we'll get into it here in a minute. Deceitfulness, and we are going to be in Hebrews 3 if you've got your Bibles. Hebrews chapter 3. And let's talk about deceitfulness. Because this is about the internal war. This is all about deception. The enemy has no power. Right? right. No power. So how does he get you? <laughs> if he can't make you do anything, he has to deceive you into doing things. This whole thing is about deception. Again, Satan had no power over Adam and Eve. So all he could do was what? Deceive them into eating that tree. That is, that, if they would have been able to say no and see the deception, he had nothing else. And can you imagine that's the only weapon he has against us as a church, as the body of Christ? There's no power. It's deception. Well, he, you know, remember Flip Wilson, the devil made me do it? Wasn't that him that said that all the so. time? Well, the devil doesn't make you do anything. He deceives you into doing things. Big difference. So deceitfulness means this. Deceitfulness means to believe something that is not true. Believing <clears throat> deceit means that you not only believe it, but you pro propagate it. Deceived means that you believe a lie. Deceitfulness means you not only believe it, but you promote it and instill it in others. It's one thing to believe a lie, but to really believe it and be deceived, but to be deceitful is that you take that lie you're deceived with and you start telling everybody that lie. And you multiply that lie that you've been, you've been deceived by by telling others. And this is what happens in churches. It happens in the world, definitely. Fake, you know what fake news is about? Getting you to believe a lie. Why? So that that lie gets multiplied and spread throughout the United States. To get you into an ideology, to get you into a mindset, a belief system. Right? Yep. That's what all this is about. What you're seeing on TV, news and all that, it is lies in order to deceive so that you believe those lies and you become deceitful when you put it on your Facebook, what you read on somebody else's Facebook. You become deceitful by spreading it. And the whole purpose of deceit and deceitfulness is to multiply it into the lives of others. This is what the gospel's for. To be believed, right? And then to promote it into the lives of other people so it gets multiplied. So you got deception on one end and the gospel on the other. <clears throat> and both of these are trying to... And you know, God's trying to get his, the gospel message out there, and the devil's getting out his deceit and his lies and all of that. So you actually multiply, multiply your influence, whether you're preaching the gospel or you're believing a lie. You are multiplying it in the lives of other people. So the deceitfulness of sin is the same way the gospel gets multiplied. Sin, and that's what we're looking at here first, the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is missing the mark. <clears throat> And whatever it is, and whatever it is, in fact, it multiplies in the lives of other people. So we have a war going on, and how do I win this battle of truth being twisted that is designed for liberation? So God gives you truth to liberate. The enemy takes that truth, twists it, contorts it, does everything he can to compromise, and then presents it, because then truth doesn't set you free if it's a deception. All deception has its basis in truth. Every lie has its basis in some aspect of truth. Okay? And truth is supposed to liberate. So think about it. If the enemy can take the truth that sets you free and twist that truth, you no longer can be free. Even if it's a half-truth, there'll still be an aspect of bondage there. So the enemy's goal is to take this truth, twist it, contort it, whatever he can do to it, because that truth is designed for multiplication. So instead, he takes it, brings it forth as a seat, and multiplies it in that arena. So watch how this works out. So out of my spirit, out of your spirit, God gives us revelation. He speaks truth. He unveils himself. My mind gets renewed. I have an experience. 
then when I speak that experience into the lives of other people, <clears throat> then, that, then that turns to multiplication because I've just applied that truth outwardly. The truth I got inwardly, I speak outwardly, and then it multiplies. All right? So from the spirit to our minds, out of our my, mouth to multiplication, getting others free. This is all about not only you, but other people. You can't take this truth and go be an island somewhere and hang out in your house and never go outside the four walls. That's not what truth is designed to do. That's not what deception is designed to do, is it? If I want to bring deception on this crowd, I'll start with him because I think he'll talk to her. She'll talk to him. And before you know it, we've, we've taken the whole church in a certain direction called lie. It's n lie, a lie is never... Satan could care less if, if he lies to you and you go off into your room and you stay there the rest of your life. He's going like, well, he didn't do nothing with that. Well, let's take that lie and give it to somebody else who's going to go shout it from the housetops because we want to deceive the world and blind the minds of people. So, same thing with the gospel. This truth is not just to set us free. It's so that we can take it and multiply it in the lives of other people. And if we're not other people oriented, we have missed it by a mile as a church. Okay? So, and in the process of all of this is where the enemy works over time 24-7 called deception. So let's look at Hebrews 3.12. This verse may take on a whole new meaning to you once you see it in the light of what we're saying. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Now the key to this is in you. You may want to underline that or take that note put out there. In you, in, in, in any of you. That's the key. So let's read it again. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in, in, in any of you be, uh, an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So that deception is in you sp speaks to your mind, tries to get you to think a certain way. So when you do that, you end up with an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. Now, he's not talking to unbelievers here. These are Hebrew Christians. That's the title of the book, Hebrews. He's talking to Christians, and he says, if you depart from the living God, it is a result of some type of deception that created a heart, an evil heart of unbelief that caused you to depart. So again, it's going to be a lie that causes you... Now look, now it says living God. What do you think that is? What do you think that means, living God? I've always thought that, you know, growing up reading that, that that would be me departing from God saying, I'm an atheist now, I don't want you, I don't need you, I'm out of here. But it's not that. The, the fact that he puts living God in front of that is huge. He could have just said, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief departing from God. Why does he put living in there? Because where is God living at? In us. In us. There is life 24-7 being generated through <clears throat> us. And we hear that life. And we step out and we um, apply that in our daily living. Remember what he says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. So that, vo that life, that living God is speaking to us truth, and the enemy is speaking to us lies. And when we entertain the lies, we end up having unbelief, <coughs> and we depart. Not that I don't want to serve you no more, but I'm no longer hearing you speak. Go back. Today if you hear his voice, do not what? Harden your heart. Verse... Um, 15, just two, two verses down. So today, if you hear his voice, do hard. God is constantly speaking, and we need to be listening, because when we take that truth and get that revelation, it, then we have the experience, and then we speak that experience, which is the cross. You know, in 1 Corinthians 1.18, the power is in the cross. The power is in the proclamation of the cross. Okay, does that make sense? So take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. No longer relying on the internal God that unveils himself, that brings the manifestation, 
but that we hear the voices, which could be I hear my flesh speaking, I hear religion speaking, I hear somebody else speaking, I entertain other thoughts, then the voice within. And then I've just, and we do this all the time. You'll sit in front of a TV and hear someone, you go, and they'll take you line upon line, and you go, that's true, that makes sense. And before you know it, you are completely out of a truth that God has believing them because they just led you by breadcrumbs. <clears throat> and then you hear your preacher say something, you're like, oh my God, that's right, you make the adjustment. But what happens is he's trying to draw you away from the voice, the living God within. So let's go to verse 13. So we don't do that. What do we do? But exhort one another daily. Why? Why are we exhorting? Because we don't want to depart from the living God. Because it's so easy. You don't understand how easy it is to do. Otherwise, why does he tell us this? If it's really hard to do and only a few do it, why even say it? This ended up being scripture for everybody to read. So this is something that we all can easily be turned from by hearing other voices, other ideologies, philosophies, other things that, that aren't necessarily Christian. He says, so, but exhort one another daily while it is called today. Now, this living God, departing from the living God, let me just make this statement, it's also departing from the new way of living because God is life, <clears throat> the Zoe life. And so departing from the living God is the departing from the new covenant, departing from grace, departing from the Holy Spirit, and reverting back to the flesh. So we encourage one another, exhort one another daily, while it is still called today, lest any of you be hardened through what? The deceitfulness of sin. Now don't think of that solely as, well, that's murder and fornication and drunkenness and all that. Those are the fruit, okay, of sin. But I'm going to tell you what, and it's so deceitful, we didn't know what the sin was. Here's the sin. Lie. Adam and Eve had no sins. And what would you say the deceitfulness of sin was for them? The lie. The lie. And because of that lie comes all the fruit of it. So you, you may be, the, the devil may say to you, and I'm just throwing some stuff out at you, so you, you work your own life into this. But let's say um, that you, you, you've gone through a divorce or you're going through bankruptcy, you're going through some hard time, you got laid off, you got fired, I don't know. And the devil wants you to go buy a 12-pack, because six-packs don't work anymore, 12-packs, <laughs> and call it a day. You deserve this. Look what happened to you. And you're like, yeah. I, and you're like, I do need a break. And see how he's leading you? Now, you're not, you, didn't, you didn't get drunk yet. You're in the deception mode. You're in the lie mode. And it's the, tr it's the trap, man. And before you know it, how did I get here? One lie led to another lie. He coddled, your, he coddled your hurt. He coddled your pain and made you believe something. And before you know it, how did I get mm -hmm. How am I sinning like this? It just didn't. It, was, it started with some deception and lies. Everything we do that's wrong always starts with a lie spoken to us that orients us into that place of sin. And this is why it's so important. Now, I speak from experience. This is why it's so important when the lie first comes, you go to the cross, what did he end, and what am I dead to, and now what am I alive to that he's raised me to, and I'll never be in that arena called the devil's playground. But you know what we do? I'm the biggest lawbreaker of this one, is that we go, yeah, that's right. I remember that now. And then here comes another thought. Oh, yeah, I forgot that. Now I'm oriented towards sin, and I don't even know it. Now when I get, he's finally lied to me enough and got me all worked up. My passions and desires are now all worked up. I can't get out of it. It's like a spider's web. I'm in it now. And guess what? I, I, before I know it, I'm sinning. Have you experienced that? Mm -hmm. And you look back and you realize, oh my God, I, I've been deceived. It's the deceitfulness of sin. I departed from the living God and entertained the lies of the enemy. <clears throat> so I'm like, okay, how can I fix this that I don't do this again? And it, and it hit me. Well, you know what? It's easy to stop the lie, the first lie. 
But when I engage that lie, and then another lie, and then he starts working my emotions, man, emotions are tough to handle. They dictate big time. He gets the emotions stirred up, and it's, a, it's, it's over. When I could have just said, that's not me. I am dead to that. And even if that is true, I'm dead to it. God ended that on the cross, and it doesn't move me. And that quick, I tell you the truth, that quick, he has to go away. He's hinging on the fact that you take that first little lie. And you won't even probably realize it, that the first one's a lie, because he's an angel of light. You'll go, that makes sense. I didn't realize that. I'm telling you, he is he's a deceiver. He is the father of deceivers, and he knows how to deceive. But if you keep going back to the cross of what he ended and what you're dead to, he don't have a leg to stand on. Because he's all, all he's trying to do is get you to engage what you're dead to. And if you know what you're dead to, that's like three quarters of the battle. That's why I'm spending so much time on this death process here. So, anyway, we cannot depart from the life, the new life that's within us. All right, so this is the eternal war. And I'm already falling behind in time. Wow. This is the eternal war. We go back to the old and old way of living. We go back to the flesh, law works, and we ignore the voice within. So Christians can have the living God in us to be dormant. And that's another thing. It may not be so much the deceitfulness of sin as a result of that I'm not even relying on the life of God in me. And it becomes dormant an enemy. That's another ploy of the enemy to get you to get that life dormant. Here's how, the, this is how you get the life dormant. I don't go to church anymore. I don't engage God anymore. I'm, I'm just doing my thing. And every now and then I'll throw something up to God. But for the most part, I'm not engaged. Because, see, when you're engaged, you're constantly <clears throat> pulling on that life. And when you disengage from that life and just be about your flesh and yourself and everything, you know we can't help. Every one of us is probably so busy it ain't funny. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to disengage him and go for days without looking to him. And it becomes dormant. And then here comes the deceitfulness of sin. So we walk around with the hope that maybe someday, somehow, somewhere... God might do something for me. That's detachment, and that makes him <clears throat> dormant in us. We're always looking out there, not in here. And the more we look out there, even religiously, let alone just life in general, but if I try everything that comes down the pike, a new book, a new secret, a new key, I'm detached looking at him, and that life is dormant, is becoming dormant. So we walk around with the hope that maybe someday something will happen. But so, so then this, this new covenant, this life of Christ in us, it cannot be dormant. It must be experienced, acted upon, and then manifested. So verse 13 says, go on to, he goes on to say, exhort one another every day. So our responsibility is this. This is our mandate. This is not a request. It's verse 13 is a command, but exhort one another daily. How often daily? What am I supposed to exhort them with? that they not have an unbelieving heart departing from the living God. Do you, you, do you realize what this really means? So I'm having coffee with somebody, say, all right? And they're telling me all about their flesh, okay? And they're saying, I just sinned last night. I'm so angry. I'm so hurt. My emotions are this, that, and the other. And they're just going on and on and on. So I, my mandate is to say, wait, stop. That's not, God ended that. Your emotions are dead. You're dead to all this craziness you're go, that's going on inside of you. You're not a debtor to your emotions. How many women can't leave their, I love him, with a broken jaw, broken ribs? You've got to be, something's wrong. Yep. Their emotions are dictating to them, not the Spirit of God. And our job is to show them what they've been crucified to. That's not who you are. Then you tell them who they are. And I'm telling you, you watch it, their whole countenance will change. Remember, we, we went to that, that hospital and that happened. We're not going to engage the bad. We're going to engage what God did and, and then tell them what he ended. 
and you're going to see the atmosphere change, the environment change, and so forth and so on. So we are encouraged to exhort one another that they don't depart from living God because if they stay in that, that, that frame of reference, they're going to go down, 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 down. And our job is to encourage them, exhort them daily. Now let me say this. I can't, in, I can't do that if you're an island. See, people think, forget church, the, the, the organized church, forget that. I'm not talking about that. People seem to think that they can detach themselves from people and live this life on their own. Who is going to encourage, who, who here has never had a pity party? Down, down, down. So what do you need? You don't need someone to encourage you in a pity party. You need someone to come along and say, come on. So I don't, I don't, these people that detach from people, detach from not, now I'm not talking about church as an organized thing. This is considered a church. We're two more gathered together. As long as you've got a few people that you're hanging around that can do that for you, that's a church in my opinion. Now, if you want to go to something that's a little bit more established, that's fine too. But I can't, I, I, as, as a pastor, I'm speaking for myself, I can't be an encourager and exhort people. Even I can't even locate them if they don't come around. I can't look at, see, Hollywood comes around, you all come around. I can watch you and say, they're spiraling, out, they're spiraling down. I can tell. It doesn't take a genius to figure out when someone is not on top of their game. And they're depressed, they're discouraged. Now, because you're in my atmosphere, you're in the environment that I'm in, my job is to do this. What's up? What's going on? And half the time, well, not half the time, 90% of the time, what has got them down? Lies. But who's going to tell them that? If they're an island. Staying at home all the time. I can't, you can't do it and I can't do it. So we've got to, this is why God called us to be a body, jointly fitted together, where one joint supplies to another joint. This was, Christianity, as God intended it to be, was never to be people that were lone rangers and on islands. That, that does not work at all. So we need to encourage, exhort one another <clears throat> daily. Daily? Can I not go two or three days? No. Nope. Does the devil take a day off? We know um, the news cycle doesn't take a day off. Every day, lies, lies, lies. So, lest there be in any of you a hardened heart. We've got to watch out for a hardened heart. This is how people get into funks, depression, and so forth and so on. So, what, what, where, where is the living God? He's in you. He's abiding in you. So, we cannot depart from the living God who's abiding in us. What did He do? He ended life as you know it so that you don't revert back to those lies. So sin is the violation of the law. Sin is, the miss, is missing the mark in the Greek. It takes truth that's not twisted, that's not distorted, to set you free. All right, so look at verse 14. For we are made, not that we can, but that we are made. This is not something to be tried. We are made, what? Partakers of Christ, if we hold fast our confidence steadfast to the end. So if you see somebody losing the grip of faith, get in there and build them back up in truth. Expose the lies. Take, take the lies of the cross. What did, you, what did you die to? What did you get raised to? And then set that person free with the truth of, of the gospel. Verse 15. <coughs> While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, don't harden your heart. So while it is said, while it is said today, don't don't if you hear his voice, and where's that voice at? Inside you, as the Holy Spirit unveils Christ in you, do not harden your hearts. So go to, um, well, anyway, this is the new and living way, right here. Christ in us is the hope of glory. So the new and living way is Hebrews 10:20. If you want to write that down, this is this is the book of Hebrews. And this is, this is really, truly serious stuff because I've seen so many Christians get a hardened heart and fall away. They come for a while. They're on fire. Something happened. 
They entertained a lie and the deceitfulness of sin, which starts off as a lie and produces the fruit, and they fall away. And Hebrews talks about this falling away. Paul talks about the falling away. And to live any other way than this new and living way is destruction. Go to um, Ephesians 4.17. Ephesians 4, 17. This I say therefore and testify. And this is Paul speaking. That you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the futility or vanity of their mind. Why? Because that's where the deception, if the mind's not being renewed, it's being deceived. Write that one down. If your mind is not being renewed, you can guarantee it is being deceived. So he says, don't walk in the vanity of your mind like the Gentiles do. Having their understanding darkened, what happens when that, then you, remember I said the spirit lies dormant? You're, this, what happens, this is you before you got saved, but you can resort back to this being alienated from the life of God because he's dormant now. Your focus is outward, not inward. And you're alienated again through the ignorance that's in them because of the blindness of their heart. Who being past feelings have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. And look at verse 20. But you did not learn Christ that way. Now check that out. Verse 20. Underline that. That's huge. You did not learn Christ. How do I learn Christ? Is what we're doing here learning Christ? Trick question. Yeah. Trick question. Is what we're doing here and Sunday mornings learning Christ? Yeah. No. What I'm showing you is how to learn Christ. Right. And that is, listen, listen, every message I give you is always pointing to you in him. I'm not telling you to do anything out there, which most of the church does, but don't ever see us learning Christ. That is something you experience as he's unveiled in you. All my messages are always a signpost pointing you to Jesus, pointing you to the cross. And you learn through your experience of the cross. You learn through experience of the truth as it's unveiled to you. I'm not teaching you nothing about Christ. That comes from the unveiling from within. What I'm teaching you to do is not go out there to try to get it. My job is to keep you pointed to the inward, not the outward. That makes sense? So you didn't learn Christ this way, verse 20. But ye have not learned Christ this way, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by your pastor. Who's him? Christ. As the truth is in who? Jesus. Uh, so I can't give you anything. I'm not giving you nothing except pointing you to someone. So, we have to learn that Christ teaches us from within. I don't live by the tick dictates of other people or by their directives. I live by God's directives, by what God does internally. So you don't get taught externally. You get taught internally, and this is how we learn Christ. See, you can read a book, and it says to do this, and it says to do that, and it says to do the other, and you missed everything. If you identify that I am the called of God, what God has called you to, you live this life as what he called you to and what he's unveiling, then you've got it. It's always inward. Let me ask you a question. Does a truth make more sense to you? And you'll well, Let me put it this way. Once you get a revelation, it's rare that you'll forget it. But if I tell you something, you're going to forget it before you walk out this door. But if God unveils it to you, there's something inside that goes, whoa, wait, that's really good. And, 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 it, and it makes a difference. Something 
quickens your spirit and an adjustment happens in your, you know, something gets manifested. You adjust, you reorient your life in the direction of that truth that's just been revealed to you. So the battle is your mind. The battle is your, that internal battle, remember that's what we're talking about, what battle is going on inside of me is your mind and your emotions, which is your soul. And that battle is where the spirit, is the battle inside of you is where the spirit on one hand is releasing truth, proclaiming to you to be multiplied, and on the other hand the devil's sowing all kinds of crap in your head, so the mind wants to engage, and the heart gets hard, and this comes from deception. And the enemy takes the truth, even if it comes from preachers, and twists it and distorts it and, get, and gets it all messed up so it can be multiplied as deception in the lives of other people. And, and preachers can be involved in that, mm -hmm. preaching falsehood. You have to learn to silence that voice that deceives. Because you've got the voice of God and you've got the voice of deception. And the mind acknowledges, the mind that does not acknowledge and speak from God's nature is deceiving you to have thoughts that you're missing the mark. Let me say that again. The mind that does not acknowledge and speak from <clears throat> what Jesus did, which is the nature of God in us. If you're not speaking out of nature, you're speaking out of some type of deception. The mind that does not acknowledge and speak from God's nature is deceiving. So we speak, I am living crucified with Christ. That's what I speak. That's what I believe. That's what I acknowledge. It's not me. It's Christ in me, Galatians 2.20. I speak from the throne of God to myself. I speak from the throne of God to others. Because where's the throne of God? In us. In us. I speak out of that nature. I don't speak what I heard on TV or what I heard from someone. I speak out of his nature. I speak the words that are spirit and life. I don't speak out of flesh because it profits nothing, Jesus said. And the words that come out of me are life that's being multiplied in the lives of others. And my presence becomes the presence of God when I'm speaking out of His nature. Now that's me speaking from Him. Get that? That's me speaking, but from Him. Not your situation, not your circumstance. We keep speaking from our environment. And this is not a confession, it's me. It's looking into the mirror and saying, no, it's Him. I can sit there and go, yeah, I'm mad, I'm this, I'm that. And that's what we all talk about when we get together. <clears throat> or I can speak out of nature and speak who I am in Him. It's a big difference. And in this, I'm telling you, this is, this, I hope you're getting it because it's very huge. So the deceitfulness of sin gives me a different picture. Who I am or what Jesus did. If I'm deceived, I can't see it clearly. It's a different mirror and I believe a lie. I'm looking into a mirror that's not who I am because the enemy has lied to me so much. So the deceitfulness of sin says, here's, here's what deceitfulness of sin says. Boy, I like what, you're, what I'm hearing, Greg, and I hope I can be that way. You're already deceived. Mm -hmm. The fact you say, I hope I can be that way. I'm trying to be that way. That's the deceitfulness of sin. I hope one day I'll become that deceitfulness of sin. If you pray hard enough, and study hard enough and quote enough scriptures, you'll be that way. Deceitfulness of sin. Why? Because you're already that way. Christ is not going to do anything more in you than he already did. So there's not a hope I'm going to be that. I am that. It's just that my mind has not connected to that revelation yet that I can walk it out. That's why we do, want, we do not want to depart from the living God. Or we're going to be in the deceitfulness of sin, the lies that you'll never be that way. Here's one. Well, I hope one day I'll be that way. But until then, I am who I am. How many have heard that? Popeye. <laughs> I am what I am. Just leave me alone. That's just who I am. No. I used to say that. You know, I had this mentality one day. But until then, this is who I am. <clears throat> and it's like, yeah, that's true if I'm identifying with the flesh. That's true all day long. But if I want to identify with who I really am in Him, I can't say that. Right? I can't say that. Go with me. Romans 6.
Romans chapter 6. This is the authority over the internal war. All that crap, all the lie, everything that's going on inside of us with our mind and emotions. Let me tell you, your mind and emotions is where the war is. And, and the emotions are hard to harness because most people are led by their emotions. Their anger, their jealousy, their envy, anxiety. How do I get authority over this internal war? Romans chapter 6. And this is the authority over this internal war. And what is it? Romans 6, 9. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dies no more, death hath no more dominion over him. So the internal war is death, not believing. Now get this. There's some things you're supposed to believe for but not your death because it's already happened. So you're not believing for your death. You're trying to get to know your death. You want your eyes open to your death, not you're believing for it to happen one day. It's already happened, so I need my eyes open to it. Look at verse 10. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. What's true of him becomes true of us. So we died once and for all, but we live unto him, God, the living God, that we don't want to depart of. We just looked at in Hebrews. So it's not believe, it is acknowledging <clears throat> death. The authority is death. <clears throat> so you know when, you're, when, when the enemy's coming to you, you can go, I bind you in the name of Jesus. Right? But you know what's more powerful than that? I'm dead. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm dead. That's not me. I'm a dead man. And when you really know that and speak, that's the authority over the war. Emotions, calm down. That's not your... In fact, what, what, what's, what, why do emotions get stirred up and out of control? By an external event that you're supposed to be dead to. Or if not, then you're telling me that what you're alive to, God ordained that thing to make your emotions go crazy. No, God's not into making you go crazy, losing it. How many have lost it in their anger and done things they regret? But if you would have recognized, I'm dead. You don't understand. This, this is the purpose of the cross. Let me back up a minute. Jesus knew that if all he did was die on that cross and, and he didn't place us in his death or resurrection, we would be alive to our emotions. And the enemy could push buttons all day long. And God's like, why would I do that? I have to do something to kill you to what he's doing. I, otherwise, all, this, all Satan has to do is cough and he moves us a mile. God says, I have to end your life as you know it and raise you into a life he can't touch. He can't influence. Not only the devil, but the world won't be able to influence it. And then what I raise you to, you can accomplish because you're dead to everything that's going to keep you from accomplishing that. You have to understand this cross is crucial. And that's why we're trying to spend so much time in it. Look at verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead <coughs> indeed unto sin. Reckon means you put it to your account. That, that's an accounting term. The word reckon is an accounting term. It's, it's precise. It can't be off a penny. It's true of him. It's true of me. Not maybe, but it, reckon means put it to my account. It is true. So likewise, reckon yourselves dead to sin. Everything that deceives, everything that twists to what you get out of it, and everything that manipulates, things that get in the way, all dead to it. You're all dead to it. The way this eternal war is won is that I see myself in him dead and I'm risen with him just as he is. If you want a formula, here it is. It's dead and I'm dead to everything that's not God and alive to everything that is. Here's the other formula. It starts from within and then comes from without. It doesn't start externally and work inward. Religion always starts externally to try to work something in you. They're trying to work obedience in you. They're trying to work discipline in you. They're trying to work 
with their ways and means. No, no, no. That's external. I don't learn Christ that way. I learn it as He unveils, and out of revelation, I get experience. Not by trying, but through the trust of the Spirit speaking to me. So now, what's on the inside? I experience it. And we don't try to do it. It's already done. We're already, um, we already are. We're not trying to be. And then we begin to man uh, manifest it. So death is not a 2,000-year-old past event. You might think of it as, but it isn't. Death is not a 2,000-year-old past event. It's a present experience. How can that be? I am crucified. Not I was crucified 2,000 years ago. I am now. How can that be? Well, here's the thing. You have to understand God's not in time. So, so if you were trying to relate to God where he is now, which is in the eternal realm, even though he's in here, he's still eternal. He's in here, but he's not in time. My body is in time. He's in eternity. So he, God's, time's not relevant to God. So when you say, God, 2,000 years ago, your son died, didn't he? And God's like, in your world, in my world, it is. It's not a future event. It's not a past. In God's world, that's why I see you know, God, That's why He keeps saying He died once and for all. Some people can't wrap their minds in the fact that that what Jesus did, His blood covers my sins, past, present, future, and they can't wrap their mind. They think every time they sin, they got to run to the blood. But that, but they're thinking past tense. But if His cross. Boom is present. Well, automatically the sin boom gets cleansed. Boom gets cleansed because it's not a two thousand year old event. It's a present event. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I am crucified. I'm not walking away from something two thousand years ago. I am that. That's why he says I am crucified. Not I was. I am crucified. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you have to remember God is not in time. And it will help you understand that better. So today you and I are dead as dead can be. Dead to all deceit. Dead to the lies. Dead to the flesh, the world. Listen to this. One day we're going to get into this. I don't have enough revelation on it yet. But I'll just throw it to you. We are dead to sickness. I was telling Hollywood. God opened my eyes to something. Just in a tiny little seed format about healing and sickness. Because there's too many Christians sick and dying. Too many Christians are still in addictions. Something is wrong when sin and sickness was dealt with at the cross. There's a disconnect somewhere. But you've got to see yourself dead to even sickness. Dead to people and their reactions. You ever have somebody look at you in the wrong way and you didn't like it? You're dead to their looks. You're dead to anything they can do to you. Well, you say, I'm just a Christian. I'm not perfect. I'm human. Who've heard, who's heard that? I'm only human. But Hebrews tells us that he perfected once and forever those who are being set apart. So you, you're not human. He ended your humanity, your new creation. But we want to always have that excuse to be in our flesh. And he ended that. So Christians keep, Christians, and especially preachers, religious preachers, keep talking you out of what he made you into. They're always talking you out of the cross. Always. Talking you out of your death. Well, I'm a, you're only human now, you know, this, that, and the other. Now, look at, um, where are we at? Um, 6, 11, uh, look at 12. Let not sin, therefore, reign. If this was not possible, this would be stupid to tell you this. Right? Let not sin, therefore, reign. Because the only way it gets in there to reign is through the deception and lies that you should obey its lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God, that living God within you, as those that are alive from the dead, because that's who you are now, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For, look at verse 14, for sin shall not have what? Dominion. And sin is also part of lies. So lies won't have dominion over you. Just don't, don't look at sin as only as that fruit stuff. Look at it as deceptions and lies and everything else that's not anything that's not God is what? Sin. Sin. And it won't and it should not have dominion over you. Now that sets a lot of people free. For you are not under the law, because what the, what does the law do? The power of sin is the law. 
but you're under what? Grace. There you go. So that's the authority over the, in, the internal war. Now go to Romans 7. Next chapter over. Because this is a progression. Romans 6, dead to sin. Romans 7, dead to the law. Romans 8, alive to God. It's a progression. But we're not going to get into Romans 7. This is not a treatise on it. I just want to, I just want to show you a thread. Look at verse 20. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it. Look at all the eyes there. You can see this sin not being you in this. The I is not the real, true you. It's not the new man. Look what it says. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but what? Sin, sin that dwelleth in me. Right? So... You can see that, that it's the deceitfulness, it's a lie, that you speak words that come out of your mouth, words that are not from God, words that are not out of His nature, acts that are not from His nature. You're like, your spirit is looking at your flesh sinning and saying, what's going on here? There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a battle going on here. Verse 21, I find then a law. When I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. That's my new man, delights in God's ways. My spirit amens the teachings of Jesus. I delight in the law of God. There's a part of me, which is the new man, that delights in the law of God, but I see another thing going on in my members, warring against that law of my mind and bringing me where? Into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And verse 25 is, it's Jesus. Thank God it's Jesus. So this verse 23, when he says this other law in my members, warring against my spirit is in the law of my mind. So you have two dimensions happening here. You've got the new man who amens God, and you've got the flesh unchecked that will go to the tree of knowledge of good and evil and produce sin every time. If you're not walking in the spirit, and that's what he said, Jesus is my deliverance. If I remain in him and don't depart from the living God in me, the minute I depart from the living God in me, the flesh is unchecked. Where is it going to go? To the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what's the power of sin? Law. That is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Law. It's, it's just, so you, don't, you can't afford not to walk in the Spirit because by default, you're basically saying when you refuse to walk in the Spirit, out, live out of the new man, speak from the new man, when you refuse to do that, it becomes dormant. And then all of a sudden the flesh goes, well, I guess when the, when the cat's away, the mouse will play. And here goes the flesh. Oh, we're going to go back to the old ways. We're going to look at that tree. Now, what can I do that's good? What can I not do that's evil? And it's over. Sin's going to come. And Paul sees this two dimensions taking place here. All right? So then what happens is the mind, you have to see the mind is the receiving ground of communication. God makes a covenant with us that he's going to write his law on our hearts and minds. The other dimension is the world, the flesh, and the devil attacking our minds and affecting our hearts as well. Because your mind is a continual breeding ground of thought and communicate, receiver of communication, constantly. You know how many times they think, I can't remember, but it, it, it was, un, I'm like, no way. But it was true. You know how, many how many thoughts you have per day? You're not, except Hollywood. <laughs> no. Do you know how many thoughts you have per day? 30,000 thoughts a day. I'm like, that's just not, but that's what they say. You know, scientists that studies it. Now, if, you, if all you do is think, you may double that. Some people don't, maybe some people are deadheads. They don't even think about nothing. <laughs> then those who think too much, and so they've got more than 30,000. And you imagine if your brain is working 30,000 thoughts, that's a breeding ground for deception. If you're not responding to him, hearing him. It's crazy. And remember, demon means knowing one. Demons don't have power. They have knowledge. That's what demon means in the Greek, knowing one. And that's what Satan showed up as a knowing one of that tree that he enticed them with knowledge. And so when the enemy shows up, 
He doesn't have any power, you know. What he has is knowledge that he twists the truth, distorts it, contorts it, whatever he does, and then presents it to you, and you take it hook, line, and sinker. So these, um, this, this brain, this mindset begin, begins to be a growing breeding ground, and you create new mindsets, you establish a belief system with tentacles that go through your finances, to your marriage, to every, all of a sudden this belief system is touching, every, this deception is touching every area of your life. And that's what it's designed to do. Lie after lie, the mind will believe it and walk it out. How many know this? If you keep saying something, it's going to happen. As a man thinks, the Bible says, so he is. Have you ever been watching TV and someone will or they'll say that this medication will have these side effects? And you're not even taking the medication, you got the side effects. Just because they spoke it. <laughs> or someone said, I have a sore throat. And the next day you woke up with a sore throat. That doesn't happen all the time, but that does happen periodically. Maybe once or twice in a lifetime. But you went, oh my God, they just spoke it and I got it the next day. Or somebody said something that happened to somebody that you don't even know and you heard it and boom, something along those lines happened to you and you're like, wait a minute. They just said that happened to him. How did it happen to me? It got in there. Fear resulted. Somehow you entertained that thought with fear and the enemy was able to get in there because your mind's a breeding ground to produce tentacles in certain areas and produce... Because if you're not living out of life, you're living out of the flesh. And the flesh is the devil's playground when it's unchecked. So he says in verse 25, Who will deliver me from this body of sin? And he says, It's Jesus Christ. Now, how's Jesus Christ delivered me from this body of sin? Look at 8.2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from sin and death. So it's the life of God in me. He calls it a law, but it's a life of God in me that is my... So who are you? You're the life of Christ. I myself operate out of the nature of God, out of this law of the spirit. So with my mind... I am myself serving the nature of Christ, the Lord God in me. Regarding the flesh, I know no man after the flesh. I know them after the spirit. And we've talked a lot about that, so we won't get in there. So what's happening in the spirit is that we're going through a conflict that's speaking to us. And if this thing is not dead in me, then I'm going to walk it out with a certain judgment. Let me give you an example. Let's say you go to um, and it's somewhere and you're... You want something to happen. You showed up to get a result. I don't know anything. Uh, maybe you, maybe a couple guys showed up to buy a car. And maybe you're at an auction and the car is going through. And you went out in the parking lot and you looked over the cars. You're like, man, I want that. Get the number. Be there when it comes through. And so you're really wanting. So you start bidding on that car, right, as it's coming through the auction. And you don't get it. And it ruined your day. Because you really wanted that <coughs> car. Right? So let me say that again. So what's happening in the spirit is that when we're going through a conflict that's speaking to us, if this thing is dead, if I'm not dead to this thing, then I'm going to walk it out with a certain judgment in my environment that's going to affect me all day long. What I need to do is say, well, you know what? It wasn't God. And because it's not God, I am dead to that car I was salivating over a few hours ago. It didn't come. I didn't get it, so I'm dead to it. Or if it's a girl, you want to take a girl out, and you, ask, and you know, it seems like maybe you misread the signals or whatever, and you ask her, and she says, no, nah, I don't think so. All right, don't, don't go get your six-pack. Say, you know what? I am now dead to that girl because she's obviously not what God's doing. Or you could sit there and be bummed out for three days. Right or wrong? See, when you're out there in the world in environments and atmospheres that don't go your way, you create a judgment by what you got or didn't got or want and didn't have, and it totally blows you, but you never take it to the cross. Everything that comes to me, i got to take it to the cross. And if it's not mine, boom, I'm dead to it. If it was mine, he would have let it happen, and I'd be alive to it. I'm spending way too much time on the internal conflict. Let's jump over to... Um, the um, man, there is so much. This is horrible. Let's go to the external war now. That's the internal war. I want to get this done. The external war. 
Now you're there, number two? All right. The external war is the application of the cross ending the influence or reaction to people in the world around us. And that's what I just used those examples leading us up to the external war. Now you understand we're not talking about the internal war now. Now we're talking about the crap that happens to us from the outside coming at us. See, I'm dead to every internal war, mind, emotions, all that. But now I've got to be, now go to Galatians 6 and look at verse 14. I might be getting ahead of myself, but I want to start with that. Galatians 6, 14. Right off the bat, here's how I win the external war. Galatians 6, 14. But God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of Christ by whom the world is what? Crucified. crucified unto me, and I am crucified unto it. I like the double thing he does there. It's not He could have just said, I'm crucified to the world. Nope, it's crucified to me, and I'm crucified to it. God ended the world's influence on my life. So there's nothing in us that should react to anything outside of us. But you know most Christians are reactors? No, you know, you're a mother and you've made this thing. <coughs> I'm all right until you touch my kids. Oh, thank you, says Satan. I know how to get a reaction out of you. I'll touch your kids with other people and just watch you blow it every single time. You don't understand. You've been crucified to the world and everything in it. That, because if not, how's he, how, how are you going to get raised to stuff if you keep being alive to what you're supposed to be dead to? So there's nothing in us that should be able to react to anything outside of us. If you're reacting, then you're, you're, you're alive to the world, not dead, if you're a reactor. And you're not experiencing Christ in you, and God can't help you in that area if you're going to react to the world and not crucify yourself or you know, pronounce authoritatively your crucifixion to whatever's coming at you. All right? So he already ended you, and he's not going to benefit what you're living in if you're going to be a reactor to everything that's happening around you. But God knows your needs. You say, God knows my needs before I ask him. That's why he crucified you, so you would have a life that he designed. So it's not about, see, if, because if you are responding to needs, and we do that, so that the bill comes and I don't have enough money. Whoa, here we go. Right? Start watching what comes out of your mouth because you see a bill you can't pay. Now, you become need-oriented, not Christ-oriented. <clears throat> so because he crucified you, he becomes, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. My God shall supply all my needs. I'm not need. There's a whole teaching on need-oriented. We've got to quit being need. We're driven by need-oriented. So, so all, all, all Satan has to do is create a need. Oh, oh, boop, there we are. Need dictates to us. But if I'm crucified to the world, where are the needs at? In the world. There's not a need in here. Peter says we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing um, pertaining to life and godliness. We have everything. So it, we're not, there's nothing missing in us. It's that world that has the needs that drive us, frustrate us, that we are to be crucified to. I'm crucified to bills, I'm crucified to neighbors, I'm crucified to everything that's in that world that will not move me in any way, shape, or form. Because all it's designed to do is to get me in the flesh, which is out of the life of God, departing from the living God that's within me. So, he ended those things. But So, you say, you know what, this, remember I said last week, people are going to say to me, well, you're taking this death thing too far. Right? You know what else they're going to say to me? Jesus, how am I supposed to live? You've to just ba basically told me I'm dead to pretty much everything in my life. How do you live? Have you thought that? Well, if I really go the route he's going there, what, what am I supposed to live for? Have, have you thought about, I'm supposed to be dead to this, this, this. I mean, you're killing me here. Where's my life at after you killed me? Right? Watch this. 
Two things Jesus did on this side of the cross. Death and burial. That is only a quarter of what he did to end you. Not a lot, is it? Over here, there are six things he raised you to, and that's the other three quarters. So, what he raised you to is way more than what he ended you in. So don't sit there and think death is a bad thing. It's only a quarter. Death and burial is only the quarter. The other three and four things, so, so you've been raised to so much more than you will ever die to. So don't get depressed or discouraged. Embrace what he did so you can get over here to the much more of what he accomplished in your, or what he wants to accomplish and designed your life to be. So everything comes, um, let's put it this way, everything comes when you're dead. If you don't die, he can't get things to you because you're not ready for them. So it means you're dead in when you, you're dead is when you really start living. When you're dead is when you really start living. So how do I get this and how do I get it to people? Now we're getting into the multiplication. So the internal war, external war, we got to get it to other people. That war is by the devil, so I can't get it to the other people. If he can't get me from the inside, which is a war on its own, then he's going to present the external war, so I can't get it to others. So remember these three principles. You might want to write these down. They're not on your notes. Truth sets us free. That's the one. Second one, when that truth is applied. Three, multiplication happens. Manifestation. So truth, you got to get the truth, apply the truth, and then that truth gets manifested. So everything we're learning here, we are going to share it because that's preaching the cross. We're proclaiming the cross, and Paul said that's where the power is. Application brings manifestation. This is where the church <coughs> has missed it by a long shot. They want the internal, but they don't want to be authoritative with it. They don't want to speak it. They don't want to act on it. They just want to keep it inside and stay home. They don't, they, they, I'm not a people person. Well, you're going to be a people person, but I'm sure there's a few people around you and be open to the people he leads in your path. But again, you have to get, you have to, get to this, pl this place of applying it. And I apply it when I speak it. I apply it when I act on it. And the purpose of freedom and manifestation is for the multiplication, meaning that other people benefit from what you experienced <laughs> and what he did for them too on the cross. So what, does, what, what God does in you and for you, now listen, is always for somebody else. I can't. You, this is, I'm telling you, this is, this is not condemnation because we've all missed it a mile. How many have said, oh, God blessed me in this particular area, and we've told people about it. And you've walked away thinking, God did me a solid. That's really good. And that's where it ends. It's, and we miss it because God's like, wait, I did that to you to do it through you, and now you've got to now apply it by speaking it when you meet people and talk to people. Remember, this is going to be about witnessing. Keep This is all. This is how you witness. How many have seen the, the, the TV kid on Kirk, Kirk Cameron, is that his yeah. name? How, and, do, you know, do, have you sinned? Do, or, have you ever lied? Yeah. Well, you know, the Bible says all liars go to hell. Yeah. So you know you're going to hell, right? All they're doing is putting law on people. All they're doing is taking the law and condemning and judging the person, thinking that that person will run to Jesus. Okay? But they never ever talk about, wait a minute, Jesus, Paul never preached the law to Gentiles. Do you understand that? That's why the Jews were so mad, because he wasn't preaching law. He was preaching the cross. There's no law here in the gospel message. The law is what got us in this mess. So why preach the law? Law, when you preach the law, you're not preaching the gospel. Now watch how this works out. I'm going to prove it to you here. So you are part of God's plan as they are. 
And everybody can, everybody's connected together to one another, not being an island. We're the body of Christ, like I said earlier. And God wants to do that thing in you so you can experience it and then apply it in speaking it to other people. Who, what are you going to be speaking? Because God did the same thing for you on the cross. Well, I really, how many people say, I really like to, you know, be like you. You're a spiritual giant. Like what? Wait, what? I'm, I'm not, what he, what you see he's done in me, he's done in you. Wait, what? No, it's done in you. Your eyes haven't opened. The reason why you're not living, you're not manifesting is because you don't know who you are. You don't know the Christ in you. I got this way by Christ unveiling himself and me going, that's me? Okay, I believe that. And I've become what he did. I've come to the place I am who he says I am. And the people that see me as more than them is only because they've never been able to get to the place to them in their life where they can say I am who he says I am. You know what they say? I want to be like Mike. I want to be like you. No, you got the nature of, you got the greatest thing in you. You don't need to be like nobody. You know who you are. And the Bible clearly says who we are. All right? 2 Corinthians 5. I know this is going a little long, but we've got to get through this. I am not part two in this. 2 Corinthians 5. Verse 14. For the love of Christ constrains us, because we judge that if one died for all, then all were all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should no longer live for themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. And therefore we know no man after the flesh. There's a lot there. It kills me that I can't talk about that any more than this little tiny bit, and that is that verse those verses need to be applied. No, no man after the flesh. Why? All died. That's why if somebody's coming at me in the flesh, I see them as dead. I see myself as dead. And therefore we judge all died. We're all dead to each other and alive to the Spirit of Christ in all of us. So, no relationships. Now we're talking external, remember. No relationships, no matter what they are, should rule us. Can rule us or should rule us. That's why Jesus said, if you can't hate your mother, brother, sister, and all them, you can't be my disciple. Why would he say that? Because the hate is not the hate you think it is. It is the death you died that they can't move you anymore. If you're not dead to a relationship, that relationship will rule you. If two people come together, you know as well as I do, the stronger personality rules the less dominant one. And if that person does not die to their spouse, that spouse rules them in every way, shape, or form through manipulation, intimidation, and domination. Pastors need to be dead to their congregation as husbands need to be dead to their wives because we cannot be alive to each other's flesh. So if someone gets mad at me, it doesn't move me. Sorry, but you getting mad is not going to change unless I did something wrong. But I'm not changing. You're not going to move me with your manipulation. I'm dead to that. So what would, what would a wife say to a husband when he says, Honey, I'm dead to you. That means whatever you, no matter what you say, no matter what you do, you're not going to get me to move in my flesh to respond to your flesh. But she, he would say, but that goes for you too. So if two people are dead to each other's flesh, that means they'll only be alive to each other's spirit. And you will have a successful marriage, a successful church. Because what happens in churches, this person gets mad at that person, this person gets offended at that person, and we got flesh all day long in the body. And you got people leaving over offices, you got people getting upset because of this and over that, rather than recognizing, you know what, I'm dead. I'm dead to that. That is not, that, that is not what God's raised me to. That is not how, that's not coming from the nature of God, that's coming from the nature of the beast in me called the flesh. 
See, if you don't understand the cross and make and let it, or let's put it this way, get a revelation how it affects every area of your life. Doesn't this, now, now, now let's just stop for a minute. Now does it now does it make sense why a lot of Christians divorce? They don't have a clue what I just none of this. And why people are in addictions? Why people of Christians? I'm not talking about the world. They they have an excuse. They're blind. Christians living like the world and having the same effects on their marriages and families like the world does. There's something wrong. It's because they don't know how to apply what Jesus did. They don't know how to become not become. They don't know that they are what he did. So, flesh can't respond to flesh. When you're in a situation and you don't know and, and you know it's not right, you're like, man, I gotta get out of this. This is not right. I got myself here or somebody else, but it's not right. How do you deal with it? What do you do? What you do is you bring it to what Jesus did. He ended it. And now you're in it, but from him now. So in other words, I'm in a situation. It's wrong. So I go and find out what he did. Now I'm in it, but from him. Prior, I was in it. How, what am I going to do? So I'm not going to go, what am I going to do? I'm going to go to see what he did. Now when I see what he did, now I'm in it from him. Make sense? Now, uh, anyway, I'll get to this here in a minute. Let me get through this. How do you judge your relationships? How do you judge interactions? How do you judge the world you're in? How do you judge this external war that you see every day coming at you? You know as well as I do, you're going to leave here today. Tomorrow morning, you're going to get up and do what you do, and the world's going to come at you. Remember I said Sunday morning, that world is full of sin and curse. How do you win the external war? How do you win? You look at what he <clears throat> ended. And you go to Galatians 6.14, I'm crucified to all that. It's not going to move me. This is the life of God that he designed. Dead to things that's not God and alive to things that are. Whatever is coming at you, acknowledge and speak that it has no power over you, that you're dead to it and its influence. <coughs> and at that point, you want to talk about a switch, like, like a snap of the finger. You can have something come at you and your flesh gets reacting, and right away you can get right in the spirit and make that thing bow right off the bat. But most people don't do that. They just let that flesh go, and they ride the anger. They ride the storm out. Then they make bad decisions. You can shut down your emotions like that. You ever seen people get hysterical and they have to be slapped? <coughs> and they're like, oh. And they come to. I mean, they're like, ah! And then bam! Oh, thank you. You ever seen it? They're all movies. I've never seen that happen in real life. Right? Well, how in the world did they be, ah! And all of a sudden, they're like, oh, okay. If that's the natural, how, how much more can that happen to you in the spiritual? You can stop those emotions on a dime. You don't have to play it. Just because the emotions start doesn't mean you've got to play it out. You can go, whoa, whoa, stop it right now. And get in the spirit of the thing and completely kill that because you've been crucified to it. You can shut down every emotion and every fleshy response that comes at you in that external war. Yeah, but he hurt my feelings. How long do you ride off of that one? He hurt me. He said he offended me. And people will ride off of that for a year or two. Someone does something to somebody, and man, they can, they can go on for years hating that person, being unforgiving. No, you're dead to that. You see, So that person hurt me. Okay, stop. Before your emotions, before you talk, stop. Yes, he hurt you. I get it. But let's turn to the cross and find out what he did in response or in regard to that guy or girl hurting you. Well, he ended my humanity. He killed my flesh. He killed my emotions. Oh, I guess I can't get mad because that's emotions. I guess I'm dead to that. And what am I alive to? Well, I'm forgiving. Forgiver. Nah, I want, I, want, I want to be angry. All right, don't go the way of the cross. Go the way of you. Listen about death. Death, this is internal or even external. Dead people don't care 
They don't worry. They don't stress out because they're trusting in the life of God as He designed it. Do you really think God's life that He designed for you is not happening, though hell may... Remember, you're out there in curse and sin. What do you expect when you go out there? Stuff's going to happen, but it's not going to affect what He designed life for you to be. So just be dead to it. Don't, get a, don't let them get a response. Hey, dead people don't care. They don't worry. They don't stress out. Dead people have no ambition. They're not driven. They're led by the life as He designed it. How many Christians are ambitious and driven? No, I'm dead to that. I'm alive to life now as He designed it, and I rest in what He's doing. That kill. I've been, I was so ambitious at one time, it burned me out, man. It made me angry, frustration. Why? I never got to see anything come to, come to pass that I was ambitious about. Because he was trying to show me that's not the life I designed for you. And I won't let anything work the way you want until you die. Until you understand your death. It kills all that. You're dead to the past. Somebody did something to you 20 years ago and you still talk about it. My God, no wonder you're so screwed up. You keep rehearsing it. You've not put it on the cross where it has no effect on you anymore. So you are the walking dead. You've got to understand this death you walk out daily. But you're also the walking life because you're walking out life as he designed it through resurrection. And there's so much more. Jeez. Let me see where I'm going to go. i got to skip some stuff here. Okay, let's close this out. The cross of Christ, 1 Corinthians 1.18, the cross of Christ is the power of God as we speak it from Him and experience to others. So I speak it from Him as to my experience, I speak it to others, and there's the power. Now, that's when we're going into multiplication. We've won the battle of the internal war. We've won the battle of the external war so that we can now multiply the life that's being generated in us to other people. So, Because the whole purpose of this is not only you coming into freedom. The whole purpose is for you to bring other people into the freedom that you've experienced through Jesus' sacrifice and resurrection as you've experienced. So the result of this is that we are in we are the light and the salt of the earth and we bring people into the church into the fold of Jesus if you will by speaking what he did in them and through them by way of the cross. So how do we do this? Okay, how do I how do I witness? How do I do this? How do you witness? Here we go. We reach out to people personally. You share your personal experience with with Jesus being crucified and what that means to you and what you're raised to. you ex Everything we've been talking about for the last four weeks is your witnessing tool, if you will. So Paul said to himself, I determined that nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. How many of you people cross paths every day with other people that you speak to, they speak to you, and they're always talking about what? Situations, circumstances, conflicts, this, that, and the other. Every one of those things that people talk about, you can put in there what, he, what God ended and what he was raised to. And you become the answer to every dilemma you hear being talked about while you're out there day to day. You know what we do, though? Here's what we do, and I'm guilty too. Yeah, I know. what I hear you. I hear you. No, I, I'm, I'm big on that. I hear you because I want to push it off and I want to engage that. But what I need to do is not say, I hear you. I need to say, hmm. Well, I got an answer to that. What do you mean? That conflict? Yeah. God ended that conflict. God never meant for you to take that conflict. What do you mean? You're dead to it. What? There you go. But most Christians can't talk to cross because they don't know it. So they go, yeah, I, I feel you, brother. I feel you. I, you know, I'm not asking you to feel me. I'm asking you to show me the fix. And the fix is the cross. Don't feel me. Fix me. By pointing me to Jesus and what he did and raised me too. We, now start thinking with the past, because you can't think about the future, it hasn't happened yet. But think about past experiences where people have come along your path, oh, I have a sick aunt, or my, my kid got thrown in jail, or I got this going on. I got people love talking about their problems and troubles and conflicts. This is what he ended. Everything they're throwing at you, he ended. 
They don't have to deal with it. As we, but we don't, we don't know it, so we don't experience it. How are we going to speak the experience to other people when we ourselves don't know it enough to experience it? So, God has given us a multitude of open doors every day to speak life from Him into other people. This is not a teaching that you get and you say, well, I've got to go on your merry way. This is something that you have to experience living out daily that you speak to other people. You're God's mouthpiece. You declare their death. Remember, all died, so I have to declare their death. They don't even know they're de dead of the conflict. I've got to declare their death. So a person you, you come across has, has a dilemma, a conflict. I just showed you scriptures all died. I don't care if they accept Jesus Christ yet or not. They haven't been raised yet, but we know they're dead. Huh? All died. Christ died. Death and burial is yours right now as I speak. Now, when you're receiving, we can get you into resurrection and, and get you raised to the other six. But I can, I can tell you right now, these things should have no power over you because you died. What do you mean I died? And you can show them. All died. So that conflict doesn't... Wait, how? What? But... Once they know that, you, I guarantee they're not going to only want a quarter of what Jesus did. They're going to want what they've been raised to, if they're truly seeking. And that's how that we are God's mouthpiece. We declare their death, that they've been crucified. You speak their death to what the world has done to them. You speak their death to what the conflict is. You're the answer to their humanity. It's called death and burial whatever it's external or internal. Make sense? I was telling someone the other day, I've been criticized because I don't have altar calls. If you listen to the messages, you always say, you always hear me say this, say, um, see you next week. There's the door, see you next week. Why don't we have altar calls? Now, I will if the Spirit puts it because if there's... But, no, I'm going to tell you why. And it's important that you hear this. I've never... Now, I was raised in churches and everything is, everything's about an altar call. I don't care. I, I mean, somebody can testify about getting money and getting their bills paid and they want an altar call. I mean, they can work an altar call in anything, some of these churches. The reason why I don't do that is because it's not biblical. You're not going to find anywhere in the Bible where Jesus said, now, if, remember like he's on the boat? Remember he asked Peter, can I borrow your boat? And the boat went out, what, six feet so he could talk to the crowd that was on shore? He didn't say, now, if you want to come and accept me, just swim on out here to the boat. He never gave an altar call. Never. Let me tell you why. The only time that I know of that he's that he did anything at a multitude at a time was when he fed them. But he healed people individually. He cast out demons individually. This crap you see on TV or in conferences and revivals where a preacher wants a thousand people at the altar. He is not personable. He's not talking to them. That's not biblical. So well then what? What's, what, what gives? What, what's the answer? I'm the altar. You're the altar. So if I speak like tonight, and you're like, man, I need to talk to you. Okay, let's get together and talk. Now, I'm not just going to have you come up here, oh, Jesus, just touch him right now. That's ineffective. What's effective when I sit down and I speak the cross. And I speak their death, I speak their resurrection, and they, they, and they don't know it. That's why they, they want to get together. That's why they want to talk. It's because they can't see it clearly. But I can take the, take the cross in every area that's bothering them, and they will leave completely a different person because they will see their death, and they'll see what they're raised to, and they'll get the picture of God's glory and what He's designed life as for them to have. Well, but my wife divorced me 10 years ago. It's it's over, therefore, dead. You th really think God wants you to be alive to something that is not His will anymore? 
He wants you to know. The minute it happened, and God knew that it wasn't going to, but if God says, now hold on, see, you're hearing the living voice say, hold on, it's not the end. All right, now I know this thing's still alive. But what he told me is, it's over. And I remember, man, it, it talk about turning on a dime, flipping the switch. Six weeks, I, two months, I lost 40 pounds, sleep deprivation, food deprivation, the whole thing. I mean, it ripped me a new one. And then I heard him say, it's dead, it's over. And then I saw him show me what he raised me to, and I became dead to what used to be, and no counselor could do in that minute what God did. It would take seven years of counseling to do what God did <clears throat> in one second when he showed me, you're dead to it. Think about the counseling, how they want to coddle your pain and suffering. Coddle that which you're dead to. You've got to be, and you're going to pay them a pretty penny for it too. That's free. Huh? That's free. So my, the altar is me sitting with you. Now, if you can't, if you don't have the wherewithal or the impetus or whatever you want to call it to get with me, I assume you're doing okay. I assume you're getting it. So you don't need that. But some people are like, nah, you know what, I want some more. I, I, I've got this, show me how to do this. And then there's your altar. When I sit down with you and show and, and do it right, show you the cross and every aspect of it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, so here's what I want to encourage you to do. Because to me, this is the most important part. If you don't get this quarter right, you won't get the three quarters right. If I was you, I would go back and watch this over and over and over because this is your witnessing tool. If you can't, if you don't know this, if you don't experience this, you can't testify and you can't multiply it. This is, this is not just for you, but it's you to take this in your life and then speak it into the lives of other people. Because of, why? Because what you experience is the same thing that person across the table experienced. You know, your, your people that you go to, the businesses you go to, they, I don't care whether they're saved or not, that's for them too. What you're experiencing, they can experience too. And you have to speak that death and life into them when the occasion comes. Because they're going to come at you with their pain and suffering and their conflicts. Next week, maybe. I don't know. We'll, th we'll see. I'm going to deal with um, ending conflict. Because like I, I think the thing that hit me was when I said Sunday, there's nothing out there but curse and sin. And that's what starts the conflicts. And... Um, So we may, hit, we may hit that, how to deal. Because a lot of people don't know how to deal with conflicts. And they get into trouble from them. Heavenly Father, Lord, we ask you just to take this message. I know there's a lot here. Therefore, that's why we've got to go back and rehearse it and go back over and over and over and get this. We're not going to get it all at once. If you're sitting here this, this tonight and say this is way too much, well, it is. So break it down in your own time. Study it out for yourself. And break it down. Rewatch these. They're going to be on the internet. Take your notes. Rehearse what Jesus did, not what the world's doing to you. But rehearse what he did in you and through you. And get delivered. And get set free. But once you're free, then you apply that truth. Application brings manifestation in the lives of other people. You can't keep it in. You've got to speak it authoritatively in your internal war, your external war, and in the lives of other people. You are his mouthpiece. You are his ambassador. You are the light of the world, the salt of the earth. And we've got the message. It's called the cross. So, Lord, I pray that you give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and as we continue talking about this new and living way, that this begins to start opening the, uh, the, the scales on their eyes begin to start falling and they're seeing this more and more. Every time we come together, they're seeing it more and more. Every time they're lo looking into it, they're seeing it more and more because it's you unveiling your life in them. It's you showing them who they now are after death and burial. 
and what you raised them to and what you designed life to be for them. It's called a new and living way. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. No altar call. See you next week. Hey, Greg, can I ask you something? Yes. Um, 